2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And we'll pick up our thoughts in verse number 11. Are we going? Okay. Very good. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 11. The Bible tells us there, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work to eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, not our word, obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Father, we thank you for your word. Pray you will bless tonight in our time. With Father, we pray we will grow closer to you. Father, we ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for his sake. Amen. Paul has given already two exhortations, if, if you will, encouragements, if you will, for those that had gone ahead and left their jobs and left their families, put on their white robes, went up to the hilltop and waited for the Lord to come back because they misunderstood the teaching that Paul was giving them about the rapture and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave them two, two already, the commandment of the word and the example of the apostle. And now we are going to look at the encouragement of the church in this section here, verses 11 through 15. The third if you will, exhortation for these folks to be able to get back to work, if you will, earn their own keep. In this section, the key verse there is verse number 15, but ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. The faithful Christians were becoming discouraged by the conduct of this, of, of by the conduct of the careless, lazy, busybody saints that were not doing anything and living off the church. Those that were doing what was right, those who were obeying the word of God, those who were taking care of their families, those who were still working within the church, were just getting fed up. Because, you know, every time these non-worker, non-working people, you know, wanted something, where did they go? They went to the church with their hand out, expecting. Because we, you know, we, 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 live in an, we, we live in an expectant society. In a privileged society. And there are many who go to the church, they go to the government, and they go to wherever they can with their hand out, saying, gimme, 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 gimme. Acting like children. And Paul said back in verse number 10 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. And that was the cry of these Christians who were doing right. And they were getting fed up. And they were going to, and they were going to cut off their brethren, if you will. And they were just not going to do anything. And you know what happens to a church that doesn't do anything? 
they close the doors eventually. <laughs> it's a slow death, but it's a death nonetheless when a church does nothing. And Paul wanted to put a stop to that right away. So he wanted to encourage those that were doing right, continue to do right. Don't get weary in well-doing. Take courage. Keep the faith. Keep things going. Because we see, uh, we see that sin in a believer's life always has an effect on the church as a whole. As members of Christ's body, we belong to each other, the Bible says, and affect each other. You know, it's kind of like those bones that we have that are all connected from the back to the hip to the knee to the ankle. Start getting a pain in your ankle, for long you'll have a pain in your knee. Get a pain in your knee, for long you'll have a pain in your hip. Some of you understand this perfectly. Yeah. I mean perfectly. Absolutely. Sister Susie understands exactly what I'm talking about. Because unfortunately, she experiences that almost on a daily basis. And then from the hip, it moves up to the lower back. And if the pain is not dealt with at the ankle, it affects all the way up. And the bad example and behavior of a few saints, like in this church at, 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 at Thessalonica, these few saints who were lazy, busybodies, not taking care of their own business, can destroy the church's devotion to the Lord and hinder the ministry and service of the church. These folks wanted to, these, these folks that were doing good, they wanted to throw in the towel. I've had enough of this. I'm going to walk away. And you get too many walking away. It becomes a problem. And Paul called out the sins of this group of disobedient saints. We see in verse number 11, he says that they were disorderly, out of order, out of rank. They were disobeying, if you will, orders to use a military illustration. And this brought confusion and division among the church. Next, they were busybodies. And that word means to be working around. See, they were busy fabling around and they were not getting anything done. You all know the town gossip. That's a busybody. Their nose is in everybody else's business. And they share everybody else's business all over town. And those of you who have lived in town here of Neodiche, again, you understand this. Because in small towns, the word gets out quicker. In large cities, it's segregated to neighborhoods. So you get the neighborhood gossip, but not the entire city gossip. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 13, Paul suggested this. About busybodies. 2nd, 1 Timothy, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 13.
1 Timothy 5 and verse 13, the Bible says there, And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. Paul says that a busybody, and he suggests that busybodies stick their no, don't stick their nose where it doesn't belong. Handle your own business. But busybodies, they always stick their nose where it doesn't belong. And you know, sometimes you can get hurt sticking your nose where it doesn't belong. And unfortunately, busybodies can hurt people within a church, people within a community. with their idle gossip that usually they don't get right. You know, because all the gossips play the game of telephone. And if you've ever played that game, it's a very interesting game. You know, you start out with one statement and then it goes through a line. And at the end of the line, about 10 people, it's a totally different statement then the first statement that came out that's gossip and busybodies because they change the story or they you know they tell fish stories yep you know you know i went on my honeymoon and i went trout fishing there in arkansas on mountain home and i caught a fish that big that that big it was that big i put it back it's the only fish I caught. See, every society has its saying about idleness. The Romans said by... Okay. By doing nothing, men learn to do evil. And that's true. You leave someone to their own devices and they will go wrong more often than they will go right. Because it's easier to go wrong than to do right. Isaac Watts wrote, For Satan finds some mischief still for idle hands to do. Jewish rabbis taught, He who does not teach his son a trade teaches him to be a thief. Some truth in all of those sayings. But instead of all the noisy running around these people were doing, they should be, the Bible says, with quietness in our text. In verse number 12, the end of verse number 12. That they should be with quietness. With quietness they work and eat their own bread. Their wrong view about the, turn, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ brought them, if you will, to a fever pitch of excitement and emotion. And that emotion was carrying them away. We've seen it recently in our society. And the protests and the riots, it's all emotion. It's all emotion that's gotten out of hand, for the most part. And it leads to the actions that took place, and the riots, and the looting, and everything else, because everything was brought to a fever pitch of emotion. This group on this side, this group on this side, they're yelling at each other so much. No wonder a fight doesn't break out. And that's what these people were experiencing, that fever pitch of excitement. And Paul told them basically this. 
He said, your over-emotional attitude is wrong. Settle down and get to work. Because work is a great antidote for, un, for the unbalanced speculation and unthinking activity of the busybody saints. Get back to work. But let's suppose, if you will, these saints did not obey God's word and go back to work. What should be the next steps that the church should take with these who would refuse to listen. See, Paul had taken the first step when he exhorted them back in his first letter in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 14. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14. Paul said there, Now we exhort you, brethren, Warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Paul told them that they were wrong. But they still kept going, their get, kept going in their unruly behavior. Paul also warned them again here in 2 Thessalonians. And he goes a step further and he says, if these believers didn't obey, then the church members should discipline them personally. Now, church discipline is not a popular or practice subject in churches today. In fact, in many churches, once a person is baptized and they become a member of a church, they are left to themselves, pretty much. And if a member commits a gross public sin, then that member would probably be dealt with by the pastor or by the board of deacons and trustees, but not by the church body. who would begin to minister to them and exercise discipline over that person. So this leads us to a question, what is church discipline? Well, I know one thing it is not. What it is not is the pastor or the board acting like the church police to trap a sinning saint and to keep them and to kick them out of the church. That's not my job. It's not our board's job. I'm not here to kick people out because of their gross sin. Because if we're honest, none of us will be able to walk through the door because of our sin. The church is not a social club for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And I am a sinner just like the rest. Nothing special about me except my call of God to preach. That's it. Otherwise, I go through the same struggles and have the same problems and sins like you. And struggle with the same things, just like you. And there is no doubt that there are churches with such a dictatorial leadership that they do that. But this is not what Paul was thinking when he talked about church discipline. What Paul was thinking is that church discipline is to a church member what family discipline is to a child. When you raised your children, when they did wrong, did you kick them out of the house? I know you wanted to. <laughs> Probably more than once. You wanted to pack up their stuff and put it, you know, on the curb when they got home from school. Okay, here you go. But you didn't, did you?
And why didn't you? Because you loved your kids, right? Don't you think God's the same way with us? We step out of line. We step out of line sometimes. We get disorderly sometimes. We don't do what we are supposed to do sometimes. But God doesn't kick us out of the family. God doesn't pack our things and put them on the curb and say, okay, here you go. You're out. No, God doesn't do that. In fact, because God loves us, the Bible says, he chasteneth us and scourgeth every son. When we get out of line, God lovingly puts us back in line. That's true church discipline. It's not to kick people out. It's to restore people back to their fellowship with the Lord. Our ministry is a ministry of reconciliation. Reconciling people to God in salvation. Reconciling the prodigal son when he has drifted away. And welcoming them back into the family. When the discipline is done. And not kicking them out. Just because of one misstep. When parents discipline their children, it's not generally a judge disciplining a, disciplining a criminal. I sentence you to 10 years in your room. Give you meals underneath the door. You'll get to go out in the backyard and exercise one hour a day. You didn't discipline your kids that way, I bet. You probably wanted to, <laughs> but you didn't. But it's a loving father looking to make his child a better person. That's church discipline. The Lord working in us to make us better than what we are. To help us grow from our experiences, from our mistakes, from our sin. And to restore us back into fellowship again. Now next time, because my time is well spent, we're going to look at some different levels that should be distinguished in this area of church discipline. And there are about five of them, and we'll get started with them next week. I appreciate your time and attention.